Oh, yeah, I think it has um, started now. Uh, yes. All right. So then uh, let's, yes. Thank you so much for all your support and backup. And just you know, keep this class in prayer even as we go through with it. Uh, yeah, let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we just commit our class into your hands, O oh Lord. There are learnings that we can uh, uh, get from this book of Job that would really be of practical use to us. So we pray, O oh Lord, that even as we go through this book, uh, which you have inspired through your Holy Spirit, you would speak to us, O oh Lord, you would minister to us, O oh Lord, um, impress the important learnings on our hearts, O oh Lord, so that we will always honor you and we will worship you in everything and in all circumstances. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. So the uh, we have finished the, um, you know, the what they call the Pentateuch, the first five books, the Torah, that is done. After that, we moved into the historical books. And that finished last class with Esther. Um, and uh, so now in our, you know, uh, English arrangement of the of the Bible, uh, we now move into the wisdom books. If you remember, we had talked about how the um, Hebrew arrangement of the books is different, you know, in their Hebrew Bible. But here in our English uh, Bibles, uh, we are now moving into the um, wisdom books. These are the poetic books. And the first of the poetic books uh, is um, the book of Job. Um, it's written in the form of a drama. Now, this is a true event that took place. Uh, this is not fiction. Uh, this is a historical uh, event that took place in the life of Job. However, it has been um, written out in the format of a drama, which is why you have a lot of dialogues. Uh, you know, if you have a, um, if you have a modern day uh, serial or an episode running on uh, on screen, you would have a lot of action. You know, you would have people moving around and doing things, and uh, you know, you see car chases and all of that. But in a stage drama, it's mainly dialogue based, which is why when we look at this book of Job, we have a series of speeches being given. Uh, you have uh, Job speaking. He makes multiple speeches. And then you have his friends, his three friends, who also make speeches. And then in the end, you have God who makes two speeches. So you have um, multiple speeches because this, um, this has been written in the format of a stage drama. So let's begin by looking at the background to the story. Uh, in Job chapter 1, verses 8 to 10 is where we see that uh, when the angels, including the fallen angels, when they come to present themselves uh, before God, um, uh, this is what the Lord says to Satan. Uh, that would be in Job one, chap um, Job chapter one, verse eight. Then the Lord said to Satan, "Have you considered my son servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright." a man who fears God and shuns evil. So the Lord speaks very highly of Job uh, before Satan. Uh, you see, if the Lord had not brought up Job's name, none of the problems which happened to Job would have occurred. You know, So um, the Lord deliberately chooses to bring up Job's name. And then you have all the uh, events which take place after that happening. And uh, so when the Lord speaks highly of Job in this manner, holding him up as an example uh, of how Job worships the Lord and honors and respects the Lord, then Satan says, and this is an important statement because this is what um, this entire book is going to revolve around. Uh, so Satan says, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put an edge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands. And uh, so Satan is saying, huh, it's because you've been good to him. That is the reason that he is worshipping you. That is the reason you know, he shuns evil and does what is right. Um, and so he says in verse 11, Satan says, but now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has 
and he will surely curse you to your face is what satan says um so this is the challenge which satan is throwing to god he is saying god the reason these humans worship you is because of the blessings that you give them if you were to withdraw all the blessings they will curse you in other words satan is saying god you are not worthy of worship you need to do something for people then they will worship you but actually just for your sake for you and you alone and not for the blessings you would not be worthy it's because of the blessings that you are worthy it's you know it's a very serious allegation where satan is attacking the very um, nature and character of god he is saying god you are not good enough in yourself to be worthy of worship if you do things to bribe people into worshiping you then yes they will worship you but you in your um, inherent nature you are not worthy of worship you know uh, satan does not worship the lord he has no respect and honor for god and so this is his perspective and he is saying humans are also just like me if you take away their blessings they too will not worship you they too will curse you as i am doing you know is what satan is is um, uh, is indirectly saying to god and so this entire book has been written to show us the true character of god and that he is indeed worthy of worship okay no matter what circumstances we may be going through whether we are being blessed or whether we are not being blessed it does not change the basic inherent good just fair character of god he is worthy of worship and uh, so that is brought out in this uh, in this entire book so um in uh, and so uh, yeah so because of the challenge which satan throws uh, the lord says all right i will withdraw my blessings and so in in one single day job loses all of his wealth and then the most painful thing he loses 10 his children all of his children he loses and all of this takes place in one single day and so you know um just to lose all of your finances and be left with nothing uh, itself is a shock uh, and if it were to happen in one day it would be a big shock but then on that very same day to also lose the people that you have loved you know these are the children for whom he had been performing sacrifices uh, because he, he you know he not only performs sacrifices for himself uh, to to uh, to make uh, repentance before god he even offers sacrifices on behalf of his children because he loves them they mean everything to him and he loses all 10 of them in that same day when he has lost all of his finances so the lord withdraws all of his uh blessings i see a raised hand over here it says that gautam bidan has uh, uh, bidian has raised a hand if you have a question uh, then you can unmute otherwise you know i'll just continue because we have uh, lost time uh, yeah uh, so yes so um job loses all of it and this is what it says this is his response at the end of that horrible horrible day job chapter 1 verses 20 to 22 it says uh, job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head you know this is his uh, way their cultural way of expressing their deepest pain and mourning and then it says he fell to the ground not just to uh, uh, not just in sorrow it says he fell to the ground in worship so this man is clearly admitting Yes in one day I have lost everything but my god is worthy of worship he is proving that and so he says very plainly naked i came from my mother's womb naked i will repart the lord gave and the lord has taken away may the name of the lord be praised and it says in the next verse uh, verse 22 in all this job did not sin by charging god with wrong doing he does not charge god with wrong doing he does not say god you have wronged me he does not say that so we see that 
and so the next time you know uh, uh, we do not know how long he lives in this way uh, how many weeks go by or how many months go by you know where he's living penniless uh, you know, and um, you know uh, in sorrow because of the loss of his children so we don't know how long he lives in this manner and then there's a time when all the angels come back uh, to you know um, present their account before god and at that time again it is god who deliberately brings up job's name you know the story could have just ended there but now god again brings up his name and now everything you know all the stakes now go up to a higher level so now when again um, god brings up job's name and says see the man is still worshiping me he still says that i am uh, you know um, that my my name is worthy to be praised then satan now says in job chapter 2 verses 4 to 5 um skin for skin a man will give all he has for his own life but now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones and he will surely curse you to your face okay so this is now the new challenge that satan is uh, throwing up and uh, so the lord says all right then in that case i will even withdraw that one blessing you know where i'm shielding him and granting him health even that i shall withdraw and that is withdrawn from him um uh, job comes down with a terrible sickness um and then uh, his wife is unable to see you know his condition and this is what she says in verses uh, in verse 9 and she says his wife said to him are you still maintaining your integrity curse god and die and then he says you are talking like a foolish woman shall we accept good from god and not trouble so you see even now he admits that god is worthy of worship that god knows what he is doing that god definitely must be having something in mind and so he says shall we accept only good even when there is trouble definitely god is in control definitely god must be having some purpose in mind and so it says over there in uh, job 2 verse 10 in all this job did not sin in what he said and then uh, from there you know we move into the um, rest of the passages where you have the uh, the friends of job coming to sit along with him uh, so we have these three friends who come and when they come and they look at his pathetic condition you know the man is now penniless he has lost his children he now he no longer even has his health and uh, so he's probably in a very bad state there are various places where you know job says i'm at the point of death so this is not just a skin disease this is something much worse he's in he's in a very bad condition um almost in a sort of dying condition because he he says that in various places about himself so when his friends see him in that state it says that they break down and they cry you know they and then they just sit with him for 7 days and night i mean what can you say to a person who has undergone all of that you know i mean um, in w- what words of comfort can you give and so they just sit with him empathize with him and they mourn with him for this horrible um, you know situation that he is going through um and uh, um so after this uh, we see uh elifas speaks up okay the first friend and then he says um in job chapter 4 verse 5 he says trouble comes to you and you are discouraged it strikes you and you are dismayed and then he says should not your piety be your confidence and your blameless ways your hope you know he's basically saying if you had piety job then you would be confident if you were blameless in your ways then i'm sure you would have hope but it looks like you messed up somewhere looks like you've committed some really terrible sin and that is the reason why you don't have confidence and hope right now so you know in verse 7 he says consider now who being innocent has ever perished where were the upright ever destroyed the innocent never perish uh, the upright are never destroyed so that means you must have committed some horrible sin so job it's time 
for you to repent, confess your sins, you know, and get back to God. So he repeats this idea again and again, and his other two friends also repeat this very same idea. All of them are lovingly trying to tell Job, you have done something really sinful. You need to confess your sin. Then the Lord will forgive you, and then you know you will experience God's mercies once again. But we, the audience of this drama, you know, we know the reality. It is not because of any sin which Job had done. So, but Job and his friends are, you know, are not aware of this. So, in uh, Job chapter five, verse seventeen, this is what Eliphaz says. He says, "Blessed is the one whom God corrects." So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. Okay, so he he says to Job, "Don't um, despise God's disciplining. The sickness which has come upon you, it's due to God disciplining you. So you know why don't you repent?" And uh, later on in chapter twenty-two, verse twenty-three, again he is saying the same thing. He says, "If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. If you remove wickedness." Far from your tent, and so um, in uh, Job's speeches, he tries to defend himself. He says, "No, I have not committed any sin. Uh, I, ha I have maintained a blameless walk with God. You know, whenever I have any wrong has been done, I immediately go and make sacrifices uh, for myself before God, and I confess and I repent. So I have tried to maintain a clean slate, you know, before God." Uh, so he tries to explain that, but then they have no other explanation to give, and so they go on attacking him, and they go on saying, "No, you must have sinned." Um, and um, uh, not today, but in the previous mentoring hour, you know, the last week, uh, Jean had talked about grief, and then she had talked about the different stages of grief, and she had, even, in fact, even touched upon uh, Job as an example, if you remember. Uh, she talked about some of the stages of grief, such as anger, you know, bargaining with God and with people, uh, going into depression, and uh, so uh, we see Job going through these stages uh, in his suffering. So, because of the way his um, friends are attacking him and implying that there is some hidden sin in his life, uh, because of that, uh, you know, he starts to get very um, upset. And he goes into a stage of bitterness. We see this uh, very clearly, especially in jo Job chapters nine up to uh, around chapter twelve. We see this. If you were to look at those, if you were to read those verses, you would see that this man, you know, who in the beginning, um, it very clearly tells us in the beginning. It says, Job did not charge the Lord with any wrongdoing, but now the same man. He begins to say that God has wronged him. Okay, so we see this happening. We will look at these verses because later God is going to deal with him regarding these words, and even uh, another fourth person is going to speak up regarding these words of Job. They are important uh, because Job is saying certain things about the character of God. He's saying certain things about the nature of God, and at the end of the book, he admits and he. You know, he says, "I have been so wrong, and I repent." Okay, so all this is very, very important uh, to this uh, book, to the central theme of this book. So, uh, let's look at uh, Job chapter nine, uh, verse sixteen onwards. Um, you know, he says, "Even if I summoned God and He responded, I do not believe He would give me a hearing." You know, it's like He's given up. It's like saying. Oh, look what has God, what God has done to me. Even if God were to answer me, I know He will not, uh, you know, explain things to me. I know He will not uh, clear my name. He He says in verse seventeen, He would crush me with a storm and multiply my wounds for no reason. You know, is what He says. He's bitter in his heart. And then um, in verse nineteen, He says, "If it is a matter of strength, He is mighty, and if it's a matter of justice, who can challenge Him?" You know, I'm just a helpless human. So if God decides that I, that I'm wrong, even though I'm not wrong, I'm helpless. What can I do? He's mighty. How on earth can I challenge someone like him? You know, this is his bitterness speaking, and what he is saying over here in these verses, it is wrong. What he is saying about God in these verses, it is very, very wrong. And 
in that context he goes on to say in job 9 verses 32 to 35 he says god is not a mere mortal like me that i might answer him that we might confront each other in court you know so he's saying god he's almighty he's powerful i am helpless i'm just a human so i cannot confront him and and you know prove to him that i am right i'm helpless so in that context in that very negative sense he says in job 9 verse 33 if only there was someone to mediate between us someone to bring us together but you know he says in verse 35 then i would speak up without fear of him you know if i had a mediator who could mediate on my behalf but as it stands with me now i cannot because there is no mediator and there's nobody to you know um, stand up for me for my rights and so he says, I'm in this helpless condition. What can I do? So there's deep bitterness in him at this stage. And uh, the thought that is going through his mind, you know, based on the words that he's speaking here, the thought that is going through his mind is this. He's thinking, God is wrong, being so wrong in the way he's treating me. God is being so unfair in the way he's treating me. That is exactly what Job is thinking right now. Satan wanted uh, Job to be pushed to the limit, right? So Job is now being pushed to the limit. And um, in his uh, pain, in his anger, he speaks these words of bitterness. Let's look at another verse in Job chapter 10, verse 3. This is what Job says in uh, Job 10, 3. He says, he says to the Lord, he says, Does it please you to oppress me, to spurn the work of your hands? while you smile on the plans of the wicked so job is saying over here you know when it comes to the wicked people and all the evil that they do you smile at them but me i have tried so hard to live a godly life lord but what are you doing to me you are oppressing me do you see job is you know actually questioning god and not in a nice way uh, he is um, basically saying, Lord, you're being unfair. You're being uh, unjust in the way that you are treating me. So um, he's, he, he's now not just talking about himself. He's talking about justice and about wickedness. And he says, God smiles at the wicked. The same thought is again presented in Job chapter 12, verse 6, where he says, the tents of marauders are undisturbed. And those who provoke God are secure. So he's saying, you know, they can do what evil they want and they're secure. God doesn't uh, harm them or punish them in any way. You know, it's only the innocent who suffer is what he is saying over here. So he's now indicating that God is not just being unfair to him. God is, in fact, unjust. God does not punish the wicked. And when it comes to the innocent, he makes them suffer. There are other things which he says, uh, and we will you know, um, discuss that a little later. Um, so, um, from, uh, so, so in, these, in these chapters, chapter 9 onwards, uh, up to around chapter 12, there's a lot of bitterness and there's a lot of wrong things which come out of the mouth of Job. We see that. And then... Um, you know, maybe his anger calms down a bit. Uh, you know, like Jean said, there are stages that you go through. So now he moves into a bargaining stage where he decides, you know, I'm not going to sit around helpless and wait. I'm going to bargain with God. I'm going to argue with God. I'm going to present my case before God and I'm going to prove to him that I'm right. You know, so he enters into this bargaining stage. And we see uh, all the verses, uh, Job 13 onwards, bringing out this particular aspect. Job 13, verses 14 to 15. You know, again, we use this uh, verses in a very positive way. But when he speaks it over here, Job is speaking it in a very negative manner. This is what he says. Um, uh, he says, why do I put myself in jeopardy and take my life in my hands? And then he says, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. So he says, I'll stand in front of God. I will defend my ways to his face. And he knows the risk in doing that. You know, you walk up to the almighty God and you tell him, God, I think you're wrong and I think I'm right. Not a safe thing to do. 
so he says i'm uh, actually placing myself in jeopardy by you know fighting my case but i'm going to do it i will surely def defend my ways to his face and but one positive thing that he says over here he says though he slay me you know i may get killed in this process god may be so angry that i'm you know challenging him and he may kill me but he says though he slay me yet will i hope in him so now he's kind of coming a little bit to his senses and he realizes that god is basically good so even though he may kill me in the long run maybe he will you know clear my name that is the hope that he has because now job has lost everything the only thing he had left actually was his good name and now his friends have come over there and they you know they're saying that you know you definitely have a sin in your life some hidden sin which you've been entertaining so now he's lost even his good name so he he at least wants to clear his name and so in that same uh, you know same vein of thought uh, he says in job 16 Uh, verses 18 to 21 he says earth do not cover my blood may my cry never be laid to rest even now my witness is in heaven my advocate is on high uh, so now he basically he's talking you know um, about uh, what should be done after he dies because he's kind of given up hope he's thinking in his heart it looks like you know i may die i may not survive this but after i die he's basically saying to the earth earth you know after i die don't cover up my blood let my blood continue crying out for justice because i'm sure there is a witness for me in heaven i'm sure there's some advocate over there in heaven for me and my intercessor he will intercede for me if my blood continues to cry out for justice so in a sense he believes that yes you know um uh, i may actually end up dying maybe my life will not be saved but there is this little bit of hope uh, in god in god's goodness and so he says i think there must be some intercessor for me in heaven and that person will plead for me and at least after my death my name will be cleared you know so that is what he says so in in line with all of that at the end of his last speech job 31 verses 35 to 37 this is what he says he says oh that i had someone to hear me i sign now my defense let the almighty answer me let my accuser put his indictment in writing um and then he he says uh, surely i would wear it on my shoulder i would put it on on like a crown i would give him an account of my every step i would present it to him as to a ruler rather strong words for a you know human being with a very limited mind to even be saying basically this is what he's saying he's saying you know god my accuser you know he seems to be accusing me of something let him present his accusation in writing you know is what he's saying and when he gives this accusation uh, i will put uh, he says i will wear it on my shoulder and i will put it on on like a crown because the fact is i have not done wrong you know he's in a way challenging god uh, he's rather being um, very rude i would say so he's saying you know i have my defense ready he says i will give him an account of every one of my steps uh, uh, and uh, so he says i sign now my defense my defense is ready i'm signing it let god bring what accusations he wants to bring i can present my case so he says let the almighty answer me you know it's it's an it's a it's an attitude of arrogance almost uh, so th with these words you know you basically have job concluding his words what he had to say he you know he has spoken um now because we lost 15 minutes you know we basically have 4 minutes left um so for the sake of the recording i would continue i know until i have uh, finished um, uh, you know but uh, those of you who have other responsibilities and especially those of you who are on campus you know you have your other sessions so um, when when you need to log off you know please log off and uh, you go ahead but i will uh, continue with the class and i will complete the recording 
So if anyone is able to stay uh, and you do not have other pressing responsibilities, you can choose to stay, but the recording will be fully available. All right. So I'm very sorry regarding what has happened, uh, but the full recording will be available. So I will go ahead and I will take my extra 15 minutes and finish off um, you know, this teaching. So those of you who can stay, um, you're most welcome to do that. But I fully understand that you have other responsibilities and those on campus have other sessions that they would need to go to. Uh, so you know, once, you, once we touch 11.50, you can actually uh, log off. So Job has finished saying what he wanted to say. Uh, and he has now thrown a challenge to God saying, I can prove I'm right and you are wrong. You know, so that's where things have come to at this stage. Now you have a new person entering into the drama, a character who was not introduced earlier. This is a man named Elihu. So it looks like um, Job uh, did not have three friends. There's also a fourth friend and that fourth friend seems to be Elihu. Um, so Elihu seems to be younger than the others because you know he basically says, uh, you know, you people, you are the elders. So I have kept my mouth shut. I have listened to you even as you all speak. But now, you know, let me have my say. So now Elihu begins to speak. And we get to know that Elihu, Elihu is very angry with the friends, the three friends. And he is also angry with Job. OK, so we see that in Job 32 verses 2 and 3. So in verse 3, we are told that he is angry with the three friends because they have they had found no way to refute Job and yet had condemned him. The reason that he's angry with the three friends is, is because they have made accusations against um, uh, Job, but they have not provided any evidence to prove that what they are saying is right. They have not been able to show you know, that, they, that he has committed this, this particular sin or that particular sin, and yet they have condemned him. So he is angry with them for accusing this man without having enough proof, without having any evidence. But he is also angry with Job himself. And he's, uh, that is mentioned in verse 2, where it says, he became very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. OK, so Elihu is angry that Job is justifying himself rather than justifying God. And um, I think the whole book seems to be revolving around these, you know, this, these verses which Job has spoken in chapter 9. And uh, so the, let's look at some verses which we could not, you know, which we did not touch upon earlier. Job chapter 9, verses 22 to 24. Okay, Job 9, 22 to 24, this is what Job says. This is his worst allegation, in fact. This is what he says. He says, it is all the same. That is why I say, God destroys both the blameless and the wicked. When a scourge brings sudden death, he mocks the despair of the innocent. When a land falls into the hands of the wicked, he blindfolds its judges. If it is not he, then who is it? So basically, in these verses, you know, this is the main allegation that Job made, where he said, you know, for, it's like all the same. God destroys the blameless, and God destroys the wicked. In fact, when the when the when the innocent, you know, when the blameless are suffering, God mocks them, and he says, when a land falls into the hands of the wicked people who do evil things, what does God do? God doesn't fight for their justice. He says, God blindfolds the judges so that they will not be able to bring justice. These are extremely serious allegations being made by Job against the very character of God. You know, so therefore, now Elihu is speaking up and uh, Elihu goes on to say certain things. And one thing to note down at the end of the book, God condemns the three friends for the words which they have which have come out of their mouth. But God does not condemn Elihu, which means God approved of some of the things which were said by Elihu. OK, so having understood that, let's look at three things which Elihu says. First, most important, Elihu defends the justice of God. In Job 34, 
verse 12. This is what um, uh, you know Elihu says. He says, it is unthinkable that God would do wrong, that the Almighty would pervert justice. It's unthinkable that God would ever pervert justice. OK, so he um, clearly you know, uh, establishes that fact. The second thing that we uh, talk about, that, that Elihu brings out, he, he indirectly points out that God is worthy of worship because Job almost sounds like as if you know he's saying, oh, what is the point in, you know, in worshiping God? Because uh, the blameless get uh, killed. Uh, you know, the wicked also get, get destroyed. So where's the point? So here, you know, this is what Elihu says, uh, you know, keeping that in context. Elihu says, Job 34, uh, verse 7, is there anyone like Job who drinks scorn like water? And then in verse 9, he says, uh, for Job says, there is no profit in trying to please God. And the same thing he repeats again in, uh, in Job, uh, Job 35, verses 2 to 3, Elihu says, uh, do you think this is just? You say, I am in the right, not God. Yet you ask God, what profit is it to me? And what do I gain by not sinning? So Elihu is saying, you, you're you having a very wrong attitude, Job. You know, you, you're almost saying, where's the point in uh, honoring God and you know, um, not doing, avoiding wrong in honor of him? You're almost saying, is it worth it? Uh, so, you know, he 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 scolds him for the way you know, he has spoken. And a third important point that Elihu makes is that he points out to Job how ignorant he is, how limited his human thinking is. So this is what he says in Job 34, verses 35, verses 35 and 36. He says, Job speaks without knowledge. His words lack insight. Oh, that Job might be tested to the utmost for answering like a wicked man. You know, so um, God, in fact, repeats these words afterwards, the same words which Elihu is speaking. So Elihu says, Job speaks without knowledge. His words lack insight. And God repeats the same thing to Job later. Um, so the thing which Elihu is, the point that Elihu is making is, you know, in Job 37, verse 5, um, Elihu says, um, God does great things beyond our understanding. So Elihu is trying to say to Job, maybe you don't understand what's actually going on. You know, in your ignorance, you're, you've been saying all kinds of wrong things, but do you really understand all of, you know, everything about God? Because God does great things which are beyond our understanding. And then, you know, Elihu finishes his dialogue in uh, chapter 37. And then God begins to speak in uh, Job chapter 38. Uh, so this is what the Lord says uh, to Job in Job chapter 38. This is the first words which, which come out of the Lord's mouth. This is what Yahweh, the Almighty One, says. He says, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? God is repeating what Elihu said. You know, he says, you know, you're 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 obscuring, you are covering up my plans and purposes with your foolish words, with your words which have no knowledge in them. So he says, Who is this that is doing that? And he says, Brace yourself like a man, I will question you and you shall answer me. Because if you remember how did Job end his dialogue, he said, Let the Almighty answer me. God says, You know what? You first answer me. And so God begins to ask him a series of questions. And God is asking him very simple things. God starts asking him about the things which Job you know, looks at every day. The creation around him. You know, the creation which, which, you know, which, which is benefiting him on a daily basis. God talks to him about weather. God talks to him about the skies. God asks him about you know, the animals and the plants. You know, and God says, do you know how these things were made? Uh, do you know what their purpose and function uh, is? Um, uh, do you, uh, are you the one who takes care of all of these things and keeps them in order and you know um, makes them all work, continue to work? Are you the one in charge of all of this? And obviously, you know, Job is not. So basically, the point that 
God is making is if you don't even understand the basic things around you, you know, the things which you depend upon and which you look at and touch every day, if you can't even understand these basic things, here you are trying to obscure my plans. You know, you're trying to um, pass judgment about the way I function. I mean, if you can't even understand basic things, you know, like uh, how the rain comes and how the weather changes, how are you going to understand bigger, greater things? So God is talking about the limitation of Job. And then, you know, uh, God says in uh, uh, Job 40 verse 2, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. You know, you have been accusing me and saying all kinds of things, right? So now you answer me, please. And then Job says in Job chapter 40 verse 4 to 5, he says, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer twice, but I will say no more. Okay, so Job admits that he's genuinely ignorant. He's been making false accusations against God. And then God says in uh, chapter uh, 40, verse 8, Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? You know, so then God goes on to say, you know, if you think that you you know you know how to run the world, or why don't you humble the uh, proud? You know, why don't you crush the wicked? So in chapter forty, uh, verse twelve, he says, "Look at all who are proud and humble them, crush the wicked where they stand." And the Lord says in verse fourteen, "Then I myself will admit to you that your own right hand can save you." So you know you think that you know how to run the world, right? So then go ahead. Why don't you humble the proud? Why don't you crush the wicked? And then God begins to speak about his power. So in the first speech, it's just a series of questions which God asks him about his creation. And he says, can you understand these basic things? And God is implying, if you can't understand even these basic things, who are you to obscure my plans? And in the second speech, God talks about his great power. He talks about two creatures. Uh, he calls them the behemoth and the leviathan. Uh, we are not very sure exactly which animals he is referring to. But basically, the point that God makes is that he is saying, I am in full control of these creatures. And in a way, these creatures are also representing the, you know, the, the powerful, the influential. And God is saying, in the same way I can control these creatures, I know how to control the powerful. I know how to control those you know, who think that no one can touch them. I know how to run this world because I am a God of justice and I know how to bring justice, when to bring it and how exactly to make it happen. So God is basically saying, I am in charge. Don't worry, I know exactly how to bring justice. So having understood the character of God now, now Job admits in Job chapter 42 verses 2 to 3, this is what Job says. He says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, you know, he's basically saying to God, you asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? And he admits and he says, surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. And so Job admits and says, yes, Lord. If you, you are powerful enough, if you decide to make something happen, it will happen. So he's basically admitting and saying, yes, Lord, you, you are not unjust. When the time comes, you will bring about justice. You know exactly what you're doing. No purpose of yours can ever be thwarted. And so this whole book is talking about the character of God, that he is a good God, that he is a just God, and he is worthy of worship. Whether you're getting blessed or not in your life, whether your circumstances are good or bad, he is just, he is good, and he is indeed worthy of worship. And look, and therefore, look at what Job says over here. He says in chapter 42, verses 5 and 6, My ears had heard about you, but now my eyes have seen you. You know, he has literally seen the, uh, the God's justice, his goodness. And he says, therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. 
Job repents of all the wrong things that he has said. And kindly note this. Job is not repenting because he got back his health. He is still in that pathetic, dying condition. Job is not repenting because he has got back blessings. Not even one blessing has been given to him as yet. But his eyes have seen God, and he has understood how foolish and stupid he was. And so he's repenting and saying, Lord, it's true. I don't have my health. It's true. I have lost all my blessings. But one thing, Lord, you are good. You are just, and you are worthy of worship. I mean, it's such a powerful learning. You know, those of us who are going through tough times in our lives, we can stand along with Job at this particular stage where you have not got back your health yet, where you have not received your blessings yet, and you are affirming and declaring and saying, yes, Lord, I don't see any of the good. But one thing I know, Lord, you are just, you are good, and you are worthy of worship. And Kindly note, you know, this uh, we have a few minutes left. Um, uh, so, uh, this is what God says. Uh, this is what is brought out in uh, Job chapter 42, verses 7 and 8. God explains why he is angry with the friends. Okay, so God says to these three friends, I'm angry with you, Eliphaz, and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me. And God repeats that a second time in verse uh, 8. The Lord says, You have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So Job comes to his senses. He repents. You know, he admits his wrong. And God says, You three friends, you have not spoken what is right about me. Because this whole book is about God, who his character. And God says, You have not spoken correctly about me. What, what was the mistake they made? They put this almighty God in a little, little box and said, this is the only way God functions. God brings uh, you know, oppression upon the wicked. That's it. Final. It's like as if God doesn't have the freedom to operate in any other way. So they, they reduce God to this little um, uh, thing that they have in their minds. And they say, God only functions in one particular way. He brings suffering only upon the wicked. So if you are suffering, then you must have done something wrong. And God says, you have not spoken correctly about who I am. You know, like Elihu had observed earlier in Job chapter 36, verse 26, Elihu says, how great is God beyond our understanding. Okay. Um, so at the end of the book, God does not give an explanation to Job about why he went through all those sufferings. Book of Job has not been written to explain to us why we are going through sufferings. The main purpose of the book of Job is to establish the fact that he is good, that he is just, that he is worthy of worship. And you know, Elihu brings out that very beautifully, and we'll conclude with that verse, which Elihu you know, speaks in Job 37, verse 23. This is what he is saying about Yahweh, the Almighty One. He says, the Almighty is beyond our reach. You know, in our limited understanding, we cannot understand him. So he says in 37.23, the Almighty is beyond our reach and exalted in power. He is powerful enough to fulfill any purpose of his. He will bring about justice in his time, in his way. So he is beyond our reach. We can't understand him. He is exalted in power. There is no limitation for him. He will accomplish what he has purposed. And he goes on to say in 37.23, in his justice and great righteousness, he does not oppress. If God is bringing suffering upon someone, there is a purpose for it. God does not oppress. Why? Because he is just and he has great righteousness. So this, is, this should be our takeaway. The Almighty is beyond our reach and exalted in power in his justice and great righteousness. He does not oppress. You know, that is the conclusion that we must come to uh, even when we are going through our sufferings.
So yes, now we have actually run out of our 15 minutes. Um, so we you know we will conclude. If you have questions which you would like to raise, we will uh, handle them in the next class without fail. All right. Uh, but now, because we are out of time, I'll just conclude with a word of prayer. Lord, we are bowing down in front of the Almighty One. You are Yahweh, the one who is beyond our reach, O oh Lord, the one who is exalted in power. So, Lord, in your own way, in your own time, you will fulfill all of your purposes. We, in our little minds, cannot even begin to understand why you do what you do. And, Lord, some of us are going through genuine suffering, through very, very hard times. And we are, we, we do not know why. And Lord, you choose not to explain. Sometimes you explain, but most of the time, oh Lord, you do not explain. You instead expect us to walk by faith. You expect us to trust you. And Job did that, Lord, in the end. In the end, even before he saw a single blessing or before he saw healing, he trusted you, he repented, and he held on. And and Lord, we want to do that right now in the same way. We may not have seen the answer to all our prayers. Maybe we are still going through a time of suffering. Maybe no explanation has still been given to us. But Lord, like Job, we humble ourselves before you and we admit that, Lord, you are good. You are just. Your, your righteousness is great. And therefore, O oh Lord, in your time, you will accomplish all your good purposes on our behalf. And we will patiently wait for you, just as Job did. And when the time comes, O oh Lord, we will receive our heavenly reward because we chose to trust you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for holding on right up to the end. And uh, so, yes, we will meet again next class. And if you have any questions, we shall answer them. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.